I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 with my father and brother and I. We're at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. First up on our schedule, we have a joint appointment with the advisory committee for a request to appoint Matthew Norton of 15 Wintergreen Farm to the vacancy. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I would uh, like to move uh, Matthew Norton to a three-year term on the uh, advisory committee. Uh, we're going to have him fill Jim McCollum's seat. The yours still has to be so that's still going to work at it. <laughs> I'm trying, sir. <laughs> um, I believe that this one is just the uh, single vote of the chairman. Is the chairman? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, as uh, chairman of the advisory, I, I uh, vote in favor of Matthew Norton. So I just I vote on this one? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. I vote yes as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Welcome aboard. Thank you for coming in. That's been, you've been on uh, recreation for how long? Yeah, so I've been a resident of Pembroke for um, for 22 years, and I've uh, been on recreation for 12 years. Just um, stepped down this past uh, this past summer time. I was on uh, the CPC for four years before that, or during that time. Um, did the youth um, sports uh, volunteering with hockey and all the other stuff and everything. So now ready to uh, tackle it, um, some bigger decisions. But uh, thank you very much. Cool. Best of luck. Thanks, Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have a meeting with Kyle Harney. Oh, I, mean, um, I just wanted to uh, take a moment um, uh, on behalf of the Pembroke Celebrates Committee to thank the selectmen for their continued support for our endeavor each year. Um, uh, this year, I don't know if you heard, we had a really great turnout. It was amazing. And we had no F word, you know, OG, F O G. We didn't have any of that. So we had a perfectly great um, uh, you know, display of fireworks. And in addition to that, I think we probably had about 3,000 people here. It was, it was really something. So uh, this is really starting to become uh, a great annual event, and we're really proud of it. And um, it's not, it's in no small part um, because of your support and the rest of the town. Well, thank you. Right. And Kyle, do you have anything to say for any future events for Pembroke Celebrates? Well, the next uh, Pembroke Celebrates is going to be uh, the the next Pembroke Celebrates activity will be the tree lighting, and that's going to be happening as usual the first Sunday in December. But it's a haunted house all the way. I think that's the one we say about. Just to be there, cool. in, in, in all honesty. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we appreciate your continued support. So thank you very much. Cool. Thank, thank you, Kyle. Kyle. Thank you for coming in. And I was, wasn't able to attend the event, but I did see the fireworks online through Facebook live streams. They were very nice. So we all appreciate that, uh, that event that they put on. So we'll be moving on to the board action items, first of which is a vote to adopt Pembroke's housing production plan. Mr. Chairman and board members, so we'd like to introduce Lisa Sullivan, uh, principal planner for the Old Colony Planning Council. Uh, her and her cohort, Laura Muncie, who can't be here this evening, a little under the weather, so Lisa's going to do the honors and uh, present the uh, the production plan to you folks. Great, thank You're you for coming in. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, the housing production plan we, we started because Ed applied for a local technical assistance um, to work on some potential issues and we said we pinpointed that the housing production plan would get to the most bang for your buck. Um, because you started one back in early, I think 2012, right. and it was never adopted. So we wanted to bring that to fruition. 
So if you look in your package, you'll find, uh, the, and I think Lisa also gave out a color copy of yeah, the, the presentation. So you have a color copy of the presentation, and you have a digital copy, I believe, of the 118 page housing production plan. And I did bring a, a few copies of the Spiral Brown copies for you for your, uh, your library. Okay, so what is a housing production plan? It's a strategy for planning and developing housing that meets community needs and also helps you meet the 10% target set for each community across the Commonwealth through Chapter 40 B. So HPP is required to have three elements. It's an assessment of the town's housing needs, the goals to assist with um, meeting those needs, and strategies toward achieving the goals. What's in Pembroke's HPP? It's got regional context, so it talks about communities that are adjacent to you, uh, Plymouth County and the state of Massachusetts. It has statistical information, mapping data, and basic census information, demographics, like uh, population, projected population growth, uh, poverty levels, education attainment, things like that. We also uh, held a public process. We did a community survey. It was a brief survey of 10 questions that Deborah Wall from your library was very nice to help us with and post on your website. And she put it out there through um, Facebook and other social media. And about 250 respondents replied. And just was to give an idea of where people thought you needed more affordable housing um, and what people overall what their thoughts were about affordable housing. And the results are in the um, housing production plan. So why should Pembroke approve the HPP? Well, it's a proactive strategy for um, meeting your the 40 B statute, getting to 10% and then maintaining it. Um, and once you do get to 10%, you're no longer vulnerable to 40 B. You can you can basically say that you've met your requirements. You can um, at to once you're at 10%. And it's for communities who aren't at 10%. They can request certifications if they're meeting their goals. An approved HPP also puts you in line for additional state funds. Um, a lot of this administration and, and former administrations are very driven to create new housing. And so a lot of grants are tied to creating housing. So you get extra points on maybe MassWorks grants or Complete Street grants for having an approved HPP. There's also a new housing choice initiative and there's a planning for production initiative as well. So these things all will help, they, they make more funding available to the community. And also it's doing our part. Every community is supposed to get up to 10% and you're, you're very close. So how does the HPP get approved? They're approved by, they have to be approved by the planning board, adopted and recommended. They would have, they've actually adopted and recommended that you approve. Um, it gets approved by the Board of Selectmen, and then finally it gets approved by DHCD. And in your packet there is a letter from the Planning Board Assistant saying that the Planning Board did. Yeah, and I have the dates of mm -hmm. Okay, so you're making real progress towards your 10% target. In 2010, you had 6,477 housing units. Those are year-round housing units that were counted. 10% of your housing stock is supposed to be affordable. So that target is 648 units. And in Pembroke, you had 616 units as of 9, 9 2017, so September 2017. That was the last date that the SHI was updated on the um, state website. And I know that Brandon has also um, recently submitted Copperwood, which is nine units, and he was reviewing to see if there were additional units. And he thinks you're even closer to mm -hmm. that. So the Copperwood is the 40B project on uh, Birch Street. Okay. So that's not included yet in the number. So right now, if you, the 614 plus the nine is gonna bring you to 625. And then we think there may even be a couple of other units that um, that are, they don't announce where all of them are, but so some of them are protected um, through the state, the locations, um, if there's like housing or things like that. So some highlights from your HPP. Massachusetts home prices were at a U.S. average in, at, at, the, at the U.S. average in 1980, but are now amongst the highest of any state. In recent years, Mass has allowed less new housing construction than at almost any point since the 1950s. That's mostly due to zoning because we like big lots, so that keeps 
zoning and land costs and, uh, and soaring home values are a barrier to entry into the market. Um, Pembroke's median single family home price was 360,000 in 2017, which is back to the 2004 to 2006 levels. And your condo price is approaching, I think it was 314 back in 2004 to 2006, and it's around 299 as of 2017. In Massachusetts, the fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment is $1,740. You're grouped in, Pembroke is grouped in with um, Boston, Quincy, and Cambridge for your fair market rents and your fair market wages. The only um, other one would be Brockton, correct? Yeah, Brockton is, you're correct. Right. So Bridgewater, Fall River, New Bedford, I believe they're all um, West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater um, are in the Brockton one. <laughs> To afford the level of rent and utilities without paying more than 30% of income on housing, a household must earn 69,600 annually. Assuming a 40 hour work week, 52 weeks a year, this level of income translates to a housing wage of $33.46 per hour. A minimum wage worker in Mass earns $11 per hour. So to afford the FMR of 1,740 for a two bedroom apartment, a minimum wage worker must work 122 hours per week, 52 weeks per year. In Massachusetts, the estimated average wage for a renter is $24.12. To afford the FMR two bedroom apartment at this wage, a renter must work 55 hours per week, 52 weeks per year to make the unit affordable. Or they have to have a roommate or they have a partner. In Mass, the supplemental SSI monthly payment is $864 per month which means the rent affordable to an SSI recipient is $259 per month. To put it in further, in more context, we're losing population to metro areas that offer better housing choices at a lower cost. So this is a migration out. More people are leaving Massachusetts than coming, and they're going to communities like Portland, Oregon, Denver, Seattle, Atlanta, and Dallas, because they have more housing choices at lower costs. A significant share of Pembroke residents pay more than 30% of income for their housing. So if you're paying more than 30% of your income for housing, you're considered cost burdened. If you're paying 50% or more for your housing, you're considered extremely cost burdened. And there are people, both owners and renters, that fall into both of these categories. And the, the um, housing production plan does detail that. So, more households are eligible for affordable housing than you have units available at this time. So 1,780 of Pembroke's households are eligible for affordable housing, and currently 9.51% of your housing is actually affordable to people making 80% of average medium income. So average medium income for a family of four in the Boston, Cambridge, um, Quincy area is $107,000. And an average family for it to be at 80% of AMI, it's 81,100 for a family of four. So just think that could be your firefighters, your, poli your police officers, your school teachers. So two wage earners with two children, and they probably would, may qualify for 80% of AMI housing. Elderly residents, single mothers with families, and young professionals and young families are disproportionately cost burdened. Elderly residents have few housing options for downsizing and remaining in the community. And MAPC, um, which is one of the planning councils, also a regional planning agency, they do um, estimates going up to 2030 socioeconomic estimates based on a strong region scenario and a status quo scenario to predict what volume and growth will be. And they're predicting that Pembroke will need another 1,700 additional elderly householders in Pembroke. There will be 1,700 additional elderly householders in Pembroke by 2030 and you'll need more housing units for them to live in. So the number of households in Pembroke will continue to grow, but the barriers to entry, whether as renters or owners, are very high. So what can we do about that? The goals and strategy in the plan are to meet the 10% state standard for affordable housing so that Pembroke is no longer vulnerable to Chapter 40B, to create and maintain a level of total affordable housing that equals 10% of total housing units. Now, what this becomes very important because your housing units are based on the 2010 census, and there'll be a new census in 2020 
and your number of housing units is going to have grown, correct? So you'll, you have more affordable units, but you also have more growth. And so you need to kind of keep up with that. So it's, a balance, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, another strategy is to establish a municipal affordable housing trust to create affordable housing units through adapted reuse of existing buildings and town-owned properties, like perhaps like a community center or an old school. You could do mixed-use development or leverage um, community preservation funds uh, by doing a recreation component, an affordable housing component, things like that. Um, maybe an adopt an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Inclusionary zoning is a um, strategy where you kind of put a lot of the burden to develop affordable housing back on the developers. You might request, if you've developed that bylaw, you might request that they create 25% of a subdivision to be affordable units. Or if they don't want to create affordable units or they're creating a smaller subdivision, maybe they would do an in lieu of bonus payment that would put, go into an affordable housing trust, and you might use those funds to create affordable housing like at the, maybe at the community center or a former school or a tax title property. So that would help fund what is a very expensive mechanism, creating affordable housing. Um, and then you want to promote diversity of housing options in Pembroke to meet the needs of a changing and aging population and promote a socioeconomically diverse population and prioritize affordable housing on infill development and abandoned and vacant properties. So those are your goals and strategies in brief. So we um, sent this to the town first on June 13th. Um, the plan I attended a planning board meeting on July 9th and I attended again um, August 27th where the planning board voted to adopt the HPP. And I'm here respectfully requesting that you vote to adopt it. And just so you know, the strategies, there's strategies and goals. There are nothing in the, in the HPP is binding. Okay, so it might suggest you create an affordable housing trust or suggest that you adopt inclusionary zoning, but those aren't requirements. They're just suggestions. Thank you. All right, thank you for coming in and uh, putting forth this housing production plan. For the folks listening at home, the point behind this is that we get up to 10% affordable housing in town. So and, do we need a and this, on this is thing? a very proactive, and as you remember from our conversation with our uh, attorney the other evening, he mentioned a housing production plan and, and how important it was. So, And do we have um, land available where we could perhaps get an RFP together for a friendly 40B? Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, uh, um, Andrew Sullivan is going to be in front of the board uh, fairly soon about the plan to create some mixed-use development in and around the community center project, mm -hmm. and uh, that will be a prime example of a of a, an active, uh, proactive uh, 40B project that will be on town-owned land. And I think uh, you also on your warrant, there are uh, parcels that are on the uh, special town meeting warrant that are going to be designated to the board of selectmen. From Kathleen McCarthy, our treasure collector, and some that are going to go to conservation as open space. So there may be some parcels in there. And as usual, Kathleen's got, you know, six or seven that are buildable lots that either have a home or a building on it or that are buildable. And so she'll be in front of the board uh, when she puts her package together as well. So th there could be a couple of opportunities there for the town to do that. Sounds very good. Did we need a vote on this tonight? Uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt the housing production plan for the town of Pembroke as presented. Second. All right, you've got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. I vote aye as well. No, I vote aye. Oh, okay. So uh, that passes. Thank, Thank you for coming so, in. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you, Lisa, for you and Laurie's work on this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We yeah. look forward to working with Pembroke in the future on different Definitely. projects. Thank you. All righty. So next up, we have a request for road closure for a block party on Edgewater Drive, October 21st, 2018, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. 
pretty quick party. Thank you for coming in. Hi. Four Thanks. hours, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of homes in that neighborhood have sold, and there's a lot of new people in the neighborhood, but also there's a lot of older people in the neighborhood you don't see often. So I wanted to have a block party and bring back the block party because I guess we used to have them and uh, meet everybody and get uh, some community spirit going. And blocking out the roads would make it safe for the kids. And it's not going to bother anybody because no one, it's not going to interfere with traffic or anything. Well, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Ed, did the police chief already approve this? No, you've got a, uh, a motion, a suggested motion that includes pending the approval of the police fire and the DPW. Ah, yes. I did call that when they recommended it come to me yesterday. No problem. Yeah, there's been a lot of fun. Hmm? There's been a lot of fun in the block parties. Yeah, yeah I, I gotta, I'd like to get a bouncy house, put the Patriots game on, have the kids ride their bikes. Big play date. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move to grant uh, the request of Kathleen Tolley of 154 Edgewater Drive for a road closure for part of Edgewater Drive from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. on October 21st, 2008, pending the approval of the Police Department, Fire Department, and the DPW. Second. Alrighty, motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, I vote aye as well. Uh, so that passes. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. And Ed or Sabrina will assist you with the next steps. Right, Ed? That's how that typically goes? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, what you have is a, a, a submission by uh, Community Paradigm Associates. Um, they uh, submitted a proposal to do our capital improvements plan. Um, when uh, Mr. Buckley, the town accountant, went in front of the advisory uh, a couple of months ago to ask for some supplemental funds to do the capital improvements plan, um, uh, as you know to supplement the uh, uh, leftover community compact grant that we didn't spend for the long-range forecasting uh, the uh, even though we had already had a proposal um, the advisory had asked that we would shop around and so Brandon from uh, from our office went ahead and is that do this kind of work including the MMA um, a, uh, Bridgewater State, um, uh, UMass Boston, uh, Community uh, Paradigm, um, and I believe there were one or two others. Uh, the only uh, positive uh, responses that we got were from Community and from uh, uh, UMass Boston. We interviewed both uh, firms last week. The team was made up of Kathleen McCarthy, uh, Mike Buckley, uh, Brandon Gul Gulnick, and, and myself, and uh, um, the recommendation that we make is to, uh, um, to uh, um, approve the uh, um, a proposal by Community Paragon. W what's interesting about it is that all the gentlemen that we interviewed for the project were all ex-town managers. So, uh, you know, we had the ex-manager from Easton, the ex from Marshfield, Duxbury, the ex-city manager Lowell and Chelmsford, and then the ex-town manager of uh, Reading. And so uh, uh, the community folks um, will have a team of uh, three ex-town managers that will be, uh, that will assist us in all the departments in putting together and the school department as well, and putting together a five-year capital improvements program, and at uh, a, a price less than what we had budgeted. So, now this is uh, different from 
the UMass, what UMass did for us. That's at, correct. So It'll build upon that. But, okay, that's what I was saying. They're incorporating what UMass has already done to further. Right, and, and John, we've had this uh, CIP in plan for a number of years, but it wasn't as sophisticated as we'd like, mm -hmm. and incorporate the you know with revenues and and uh, the uh, the meetings that we're going to have with the school department and the various department heads, uh, and the fact that the experience that. Uh, this firm brings to the table um, uh, was uh, well worth us going out to, uh, you know, to solic solicit proposals. So we are recommending that uh, the Board of Selectmen authorize me to sign a contract with uh, this firm. All right, thank you for that description, Ed. For the folks at home to better understand what this means, this is a plan for how Pembroke is going to budget its capital for the next five years. Is that accurate, Ed? That's correct. Uh, maybe you have your next career in mind. <laughs> That's right. Um, and another thing, yeah, I guess old form town managers don't die, they just turn into consultants. So, <laughs> um, And another project that we're going to be looking at is to bring before the board a plan for uh, best practices for fiscal policies, you know, for stabilization funds, for, uh, you know, other uh, uh, situations that would involve uh, funding for um, you know, the financial well-being of the town, um, you know, whether it be uh, um, capital improvements, um, OPED uh, liability funding, uh, and uh, stabilization funding, as well as uh, an amount of money that would be set aside for um, borrowing each year in, in a certain amount of money. So um, I believe uh, Kathleen McCarthy will be bringing that uh, plan in front of you folks uh, in the immediate future as well. Now, when that comes up, Ed, will there be alternatives to if we're trying to improve our best fiscal footing on how to deal with OPEV or, or other avenues right. instead of that? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we wanted to get the CIP thing out of the way, and then that our next goal will be bringing, putting together a a fiscal policy plan of attack to bring before the board. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would move the um, recommendation of the town administrator regarding the proposal to provide services relative to development and preparation of the Pembroke Capital Plan. I'll second. All right, is my motion a second? All those in favor? Aye. I vote aye as well, so that passes. Next up, we have a vote on recommendations on, artic on routine articles on the special town meeting warrant. And so these are the articles that come up regularly. They're labeled as routine on the warrant that you'll receive at the door if you choose to go. And uh, if I'm correct, I, it's typical that these are all read aloud, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. All right, so I'll go ahead and read the descriptions of these articles. Article 1, to fund the snow and ice deficit to balance the fiscal year 19 budget, and that is for $451,000. $454. Article 2 is to reduce the tax rate savings due to debt refinancing of $185,478. Wow, you must have got a great deal. On transfer fund, or Article 3 is to transfer funds from solid waste revenue to operating budget of $200,000. Article 5 is to authorize borrowing to provide that premium received by applied to project costs or to reduce project costs per act to modernize municipal government and there's no dollars associated with that. Article 6 is to create a water stabilization account, no dollars. Article 7 is to fund the funds and those are other post-employment liability, accountant recommended 100,000, separation pay benefits, accountant recommended 125,000, special injury leave fund and the recommended amount on that is 25,000, workers comp and the recommendation on that is 75,000. And lastly, we have the stabilization fund transfer and that recommended amount is 25,000. Next up is Article 9, the treasurer's request to transfer property to Board of Selectmen at seven parcels. Article 10, treasurer's request to transfer property at 20, par 20 parcels. And lastly, Article 12 is to accept the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 59, Article 21, Assessor's certification, and that's zero dollars. Mr. Chairman, before I ask the board to vote on those particular items, I would like to 
show you um, and present to you a uh, summary of the uh, funding uh, sources that are available. This is the handout that I gave you folks tonight. It's a one-pager, um, and it deals with how much money is available and uh, what is being recommended uh, uh, to, for obligated expenses. And so let me start off with that right now. <clears throat> the free cash was certified at a million seven hundred and thirty four thousand nine hundred and ninety six dollars and we're also going to have one hundred three thousand dollars available for overlay surplus from the board of assessors so we have a total of funds available of 1.8 million dollars our obligated expenses are in the next category which is snow and ice as the chairman mentioned four hundred fifty one thousand four fifty four tax rate reduction of 185478 and Mr. Buckley and I are recommending that $600,000 of those available funds be used to fund the 2020 budget because right now we are using $500,000 of FY18 free cash to fund the FY19 budget that we are currently in and without anything any uh, uh, money train coming down the road we would have to expect that we would be spending at least 500,000 and Mr. Buckley is suggesting that we tack on an additional 100,000 for to be put in reserve for balancing the FY 2020 budget so those are the three obligated expenses that being said then we'll have uh, 601,064 available and then we get down to Article 7, which is the various funds that are being recommended by Mr. Buckley that we add 100,000 to OPED, 125 to separation, special injury fund uh, 25,000, the workers' comp fund 75,000, and the general fund stabilization fund of 25,000. Um, we actually have two stabilization funds. We have one that has been generated by the general fund over the years and another one as a result of a class action suit that the uh, town joined uh, 10 years ago with the uh, MTBE contamination. It was a class action suit that, you know, that we signed up for for nothing and we ended up getting over uh, $900,000 in an award and this was as a result of a lawsuit filed against all of the oil companies in the country for contamination of water supplies and uh, when uh, ExxonMobil and all the other big ones uh, ended up settling the lawsuit we became part of that settlement and we received that money and it's been sitting in a special stabilization fund um, to be used for any general purposes now, obviously it would have to be authorized uh, by uh, a town meeting but we have that in there right now. Um, and, and the good thing about it is that we got that money and not one of our wells was contaminated by this additive that was put into gasoline uh, 20 years ago. So, uh, you know, that was a, a good situation where, you know, we joined up uh, in a class action suit for nothing and we ended up getting close to a million dollars. Uh, so we had that, you know, set aside. I know that when we received that award, I know a couple other towns in the area just asked me that how did you get that money and I said well we signed up for it just like the OPED uh, loss litigation that you folks signed up for you know it didn't cost you anything and you may get you know an, a cash award for that so uh, so we'll see how that goes so that being said after all those funds are um, accounted for then we have about 251,000 in funds that are available and you'll be dealing with the next uh, the next set of articles next week that's article 4 which is the a large article that has probably 20 different requests in various departments and that's equal to 328,000 you have article 13 which is requested by the police chief for overtime and that's worth 160,000 uh, two police officers and article 14 is worth 77,000 and in article 15 the recreation director is asking for twenty thousand dollars to help fund the full-time custodian in their office and, and I'll be having those folks in front of the board next week 
to explain why they want that kind of money. If we funded Article 4, 13, 14, and 15, then we would have a deficit of uh, $335,000. So obviously we're going to have to make some hard decisions regarding Article, well, even the uh, Article 7, the all the funds, and Article 4, 13, 14, and 15. Well, thanks for that great description, Ed. And just so the folks at home know, the this for this um, action before the board is only for the articles that I had mentioned earlier. Ed, can these be taken as a whole, or do they need to be separated out one by one? Um, well, you you could look at um, whether or not you want to do all of them, or um, do some of them and and keep the others available for discussion when you have a full board. Very, very good. Since these are all customary articles, I think it'd be good to go ahead and take them all as a whole, if John and you are to agree with me. I would agree, Mr. Chairman. I think the plan that we've dealt here is the three of us to vote on it, and we have a little time to reflect on them. So I would move um, that the Selectmen support articles 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, and 12. And I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. All right, is there a motion and a second? All those in favor? Aye. Would I as well? So, those get recommended unanimously. So, that concludes the board action items for tonight. We'll go ahead and move on to old business. Did anybody have anything for that tonight? Well, I could put this under old business, I suppose. Sure. Um, the um, three-on-three basketball tournament in the name of Brian Van Riper went off this weekend. It was the first uh, effort by his son who um, wanted to create a memorial to a fellow who was very instrumental in getting the basketball and tennis courts up uh, and the lights and so forth behind the uh, police station and the uh, town center. And it was a great success. They also planted a tree that uh, they got help from the DPW, uh, not only in picking it up but in delivering it because you rarely think of trees as something that you have to move, but um, it, it required some talent, and the, um, the DPW had that talent and was very grateful to them. Um, but it does uh, success breeds success, so they're going to do it again in the spring. And. Um, there's got to be an over 60 division because I played with some younger guys and um, I won't be the same for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to say too, Joel Sugarman played and did a nice job as he represented the over 60 crowd as well. And um, just for um, the facts being what they are, um, last week we had a um, kind of a controversial uh, appointment to um, the um, uh, Conservation Commission. And there was a reference made that the um, uh, former chair had uh, taken 15 meetings off or something like that. And it's nowhere near that number as far as I can tell. And um, it was because she had a family member with an illness that had to be dealt with. and. Um, I think she did the right thing. She resigned from the board as much as you hate to lose people. But, um, you know, th there was nothing um, behind it that was clandestine or what have you. Um, it's a question of you had a, a conscientious, um, you know, member of the household making a decision based on their feelings. They should make um, family first. So um, I just want to. Um, let the public know that if there was any doubt as to the character of this person or um, the intent um, of her, um, you know, her being on the board, um, it's all, you know, it's all good. She's um, she has resigned, and um, we'll um, we'll move on. And um, I just wish her well. Well, thank you for that report. Uh, John, did you have anything? I'm good tonight, Mr. Chairman. All righty, so go ahead and move on to the town administrator's report. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to be aware of. Um, we're going to be looking at the board to submit a uh, 
a letter to the governor regarding um, the uh, $3 million that was set aside for the uh, downtown revitalization project. Um, let the board uh, discuss that for the next couple of weeks. Um, and I believe uh, Andrew Sullivan from the Community Center Committee is going to be in front of the, um, the board to, uh, to update the board on the, the, this proposed plan. Um, obviously, um, you know, we dealt with the, uh, uh, the uh, capital improvements plan. And then on your upcoming issues, you, um, you're going to be dealing uh, and working with the ADA transition plan and the project um, uh, evaluation that we've got coming. And I believe Brian Gullick from, from my office will be uh, presenting that as well. Um, and then uh, in addition to upcoming issues, um, November 5th, uh, we don't have it down here, but we just received a request from the assessors today that they want to set aside November 5th as the tax classification hearing, and that's where the Board of Assessors, along with the selectmen, uh, will set the tax rate for FY19. Very good. Thank you for that report. Next up, we have asked the selectmen. Anything for that tonight? Hear none. We're going to move on to new business. Had some new business as of last week, and uh, I said it was important to see them. But uh, John took a, uh, a ride along Little Sandy um, to get familiar with the uh, the pond. And, um, you know, you have to live there to know some of the nuances of it. And he took the time and made the effort to come down and um, you know see what the neighbors are talking about in terms of. You know the drop in the water levels and you know the um, the, the wildlife that we have uh, some welcome some unwelcome like the Canadian geese but I think John can speak better for himself but I think he got a um, an eyeful uh, of what it's like on um, on the ponds and what what jewels they are as a community yeah I know and I, I thank my my colleague uh, Mr. Boyle for letting me go on the pond and figure out the history of it and see who is still there from years past and you know who's coming in to live on the ponds now and it was a definite big eye opener and especially what you know I always look when I drive by the water levels so basically a little sandy compared to the other ones because I it's more of an access point to look by when you go down 27 so but I do thank you for allowing me to do that and uh, my other colleagues to show me what Pembroke is about and what we can do to improve. So I appreciate it. Well, I think your point of you know, second and third generation families um, make it a kind of special community and um, that was something that you noticed right off and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Arthur. We all agree that Little Sandy's truly is a jewel of the community. Next up, we have upcoming issues. On September 24th, we'll have a vote to adopt the ADA Transition Plan, Self-Evaluation, and Grievance Plan. On October 1st, we'll be signing the Special Town Meeting Warrant to post October 9th. October 8th, there'll be no meeting in observance of Columbus Day. On October 23rd, the Special Fall Town Meeting will take place at 7 p.m. at the high school. On November 19th, the Class 1, Class 21, and Taxi, Precious Metals, License renewal will take place. And on November 26th, there'll be no meeting for Thanksgiving. On December 3rd, the common vicular license renewals will take place. Maybe we can rename that. <laughs> on December 10th, liquor license, live entertainment, Sunday amusement device license renewals will take place. On December 10th, we will set the winter break schedule and December 17th, we'll discuss the Selectman's 2019 calendar. There's a lot on the plate. Ed, is there a need for executive session tonight? Well, I would prefer that we have a full board for a couple of the items and the one dealing with the DPW meeting grievances and rescheduled to next Monday. So I would uh, not recommend any uh, executive session tonight. I think that's a prudent decision. So that concludes the agenda. And the next regularly scheduled meeting of the board is September 24th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, with that said, I would move that we adjourn. Second. So there'd be a meeting, there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Everybody as well. So that concludes this meeting. Thank you for tuning in.